Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with 16 unknown operas with well-known plots. You know, one of the wonderful things about opera is that everyone's doing the same story, or a lot of people are. And so one of the fun things about it is that if you latch on to a story that you enjoy, you can find some really interesting, obscure pieces that probably use the same story. And then you can make comparisons and you can see if like the really famous one is 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 is, is, is as good as everyone says it is, or whether the obscure and unknown one should not be so obscure or unknown. Because the problem with opera is that, first of all, it's somewhat language-based and somewhat, you know, nationalistically based. And also, it's, oh, it's so expensive. It costs a fortune, you know, to put on an opera. And you need to have people to learn the opera, like singers, international singers, preferably, to make it successful you know, famous singers, and they don't want to be bothered learning stuff that no one knows or has heard of. But fortunately for us, on recordings, that's all different. You can record anything these days, and they do get recorded, and there are millions of provincial opera houses willing to do unknown operas. And so here are 16 of them that I've come across in my peregrinations through the operatic world. And I'm not talking specifically about like a topical thing, like all of Shakespeare's operas, you know, because, you know, Shakespeare was the topic of a zillion operas or Schiller, you know, playwrights and people who billions of people set. I'm talking about, you know, operas that are already famous by whoever they're by and stories that other people use just very simply and in no particular order. They're just things that caught my fancy and they may catch yours. So let's start at the beginning. The list as usual is like below this this video, so you can see. Let's talk about Puccini's La Boheme. That's the obvious place to start, isn't it? It's a wonderful non-story. It's perfect for an opera because it doesn't have much of a plot. It's just sort of people, you know, young people on the left bank of Paris doing young people things. They're all like starving artists and they fall in and out of love and Mimi dies of tuberculosis. That's kind of the framework in which the whole thing happens. So Puccini was not the first person to do La Boheme, or the only person, let's put it that way. There was Leon Cavallo, the guy who wrote Pagliacci. He did a La Boheme, which some of you may want to hear. Actually, Mahler produced Leon Cavallo's in preference to Puccini's and was quite vigorous in his defense of Leon Cavallo's La Boheme. Then he heard Puccini's and was like, well, okay, maybe. Maybe there was something to be said for Puccini's as well. But Leon Cavallo's La Boheme, you know, he was, he was a very erudite and sophisticated composer. You know, people think of him as, you know, Cavan Pag, you know, with the two operas that go together. Mascani was a real, you know, Verismo blood and thunder composer, and they really didn't have much in common. And so La Boheme is a longer and more extended version of the story we find in Puccini. The great, the great sort of benefit of Puccini's music is that it's always very compact. He was a real sort of theatrical whiz. He knew how to like get right to the meat of it and then move on. Leo Cavallo's is more extended, but it's a very beautiful work. Um, the other is Vivis. His name? first name was Ricardo, I think, or something like that. He was a Zarzuela composer, a Spanish Zarzuela composer, and he did La Boheme. He did Bohemios and Espanol. These have all been recorded, all of these works. That's why I'm bringing them up. You may be able to dig them up. I'm not saying that they're all in print, but they're there. So Bohemios is the Spanish Zarzuela version or Zarzuela version of of La Boheme. And after that, oh, I love this one. This one I discovered when I was in when I was in college. Ernest Reyer, R E Y E R. He was a French grand opera guy who nobody really cares about now. Although there have been some recordings of his preludes and things and you know some other of his music, but he did an opera called Sigurd. Sigurd is Goethe Dameron, but it's the actual story, the historical story of Goethe Dameron. You know, Siegfried and Brunhilde, that's what it is. But it's Siegfried and Brunhilde as sort of a conventional love story. It takes place in, you know, Brabant and things like that, and they're, you know, 
they're all having, you know, plotting against each other. It's it's the story in Goethe Jamarung, but without the gods. It's just the characters. And it's a big French grand opera. And, you know, if you are, you know, despairing of your ring cycle and not a big fan of Wagner, but you think the story may have something to it, you may be fascinated in this quasi sort of historical, mythological version of Siegfried and Brunhilde. If you think that they're sort of like Romeo and Juliet, that's what it's like. It's, you know, it, it fits the conventions of grand opera. It's very long and, oh, well, let's face it, it isn't Wagner, but it is fun. It's really, really fun. So after that, well, let's do a couple Armidas. Everybody did Armida. Everybody. The famous Armida is Gluck's Armida, of course, but there were earlier Armidas. You know, she's very irritated because she gets dumped by her, her crusader boyfriend and she, you know, flies off in a chariot drawn by dragons and, you know, it's one of those things. So there are two marvelous Armidas besides Gluck's. I think at least two. There may be more. One is by Dvorak. It was his last opera. And no one really understands why he chose that topic because it had been done so many times. But it's a, it's a lovely work. It really is. It's a very, very beautiful piece. And no one is ever going to take it seriously because it's an Armida. And there are so many other Armidas. But, and Dvorak isn't supposed to be an opera composer. But it's a good piece, and it's full of, it's Dvorak, it's late Dvorak, it's full of gorgeous music and, and translucent orchestration, and it's just lovely. Give it a listen. It's on Orfeo, so you can find it pretty easily. Boy, oh boy, is that a find, a discovery, if you're into the story of Armida. And then after Armida, the Dvorak one, there's Rossini's Armida. And Rossini's Armida is fun. It's almost unstageable, although the Met did it. The Met did it for Rene Fleming. And, you know, it got recorded. She recorded it because it has six tenors. I mean, all of the male leads, for some weird reason, I mean, that's what Rossini had to deal with. They're all tenors. And so, I mean, there are some other non-tenors, but there's basically all, they're all, they're all these tenors running around. So it's almost impossible to get together. But it's, boy, is it fun. Oh, it's marvelously fun. And it ends with, with you know, Ar Armida getting her 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 chariot drawn by dragons and swearing vengeance and with you know doing a final sort of I'm gonna get you you well I'm not gonna say that <laughs> I'm gonna get you to the crashing of the tam-tam -tam, which substitutes for the naughty words I was inclined to say it's just marvelous and so after let's see oh let's do another Rossini of course there's Rossini's Otello you know there's Verdi's Otello which is of course the famous Otello the really famous one but Rossini wrote one earlier, and everybody sort of makes fun of Rossini's because he has to squish it into the conventions of Italian opera of the day. But we forget that Rossini invented those conventions. It wasn't, it wasn't something old and stale. It was quite new and fresh. And Otello is marvelous. Yeah, listen, you know, Tovey once talked about it. I think he said that even Rossini's Otello had so much, you know, dramatic, dramatic verisimilitude that at one of the early performances at Covent Garden, one of the, the audience that was there for their, you know, to be seen for social purposes rather than musical purposes, turned to his wife and said something like, good heavens, dear, the tenor is murdering the soprano. Ooh. So Rossini's Otello is, is lots of fun and you can find it rather easily. And oh my goodness, you know the story. And part of the fun thing about these operas that all use the same story is seeing what they do to them you know, what they do to the story to make it operatic. Because, you know, you don't have time to do the whole involved, convoluted thing. You have to, you have to try and, 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 and make it work, you know, to have lots of arias and, you know, your conventional love interest and all these other people doing their thing, you know, you know what operas do. You know, the chorus has to run on and run off and, and the bad guy has to get his comeuppance and, you know, depending on what time it, when it was written and who it was written for, you may have to make a happy ending out of a tragic ending. You know, Desdemona, you know, wakes up and says, oh, hi, dear, I was just kidding. And Otello says, oh, it's no problem. I never really doubted you. Let's go have dinner. And off they go, living happily ever after. Actually, it, none of that happens in these Otellos, but it could have. You never know. There may be one out there where that did happen. 
Then I did do a Shakespeare one because I just love the piece. Frank Martin, just a wonderful composer, Swiss composer, he did his, his single big opera is The Tempest. It's a Shakespeare, of course. Shakespeare's The Tempest or Der Sturm auf Deutsch. It's on Hyperion. It's been recorded very, very, very well. And, you know, The Tempest is one of those marvelous stories that lots of people sunk their, their fangs into, but more as a play. You know, as incidental music to the play. I mean, Sullivan wrote a Tempest, Sibelius wrote a Tempest. There's millions of Tempests out there. Honegger did a prelude to the Tempest. But as an opera, well, there are fewer of them. And so I wanted to sort of mention the story um, and it's probably, I, I think, it's most effective operatic setting. And that is Frank Martin. It's just lo a lovely work, a very effective work, an evocative work, yes. Wonderful. Okay, so after that, where are we? Oh, yeah. All right, let's talk about Mozart's The Abduction from the Seraglio. Now, the Seraglio, or Seraglio, or whatever you want to call it, you know, it's it was what they called a rescue opera. They were very popular back in the day, and everyone tells you that. They say, oh, yeah, back in that time, rescue operas where everybody did them. Well, but they don't talk to you about the ones that everybody did. But there are a couple rescue operas that essentially have the same plot. You know, there's like a shipwreck or a something, and the virtuous Western white lady is living in the harem of a, you know, Muslim sultan who is always threatening to behead everybody. And she's the object of, of desire from the guy who's keeping the harem. And she gets rescued by her boyfriend and his, his ne'er-do-well, you know, sidekick. And, you know, these are comedies for the most part. And it turns out that the, the sultan or the vizier or the whatever he is, is actually um, a very noble guy. He's not, he's not, you know, he wants her, obviously, but he's not going to force the issue too much. And at the end of the day, he magnanimously grants them their reprieve. I mean, that's how these stories all work out. I mean, it's not like, you know, it's not complete cultural imperialism. I mean, you know, it's not like good versus evil. It's not, it's not that simple. It's, it's, it's a little bit more sophisticated because this was the classical period. Had this been the nationalist period, yes, you would have had horrifying racist stereotypes. But in the classical period, during the Enlightenment, people were, were you know, that kind of, you know, nationalist stereotyping and racism had not, had not become um, institutionalized the way it was to be later. So two, two other rescue operas by two very famous composers. Um, there is Haydn, the L'Incontro Improviso, that is the chance encounter or something like that. It translates it to something like that. It's quite similar to the Mozart. And like all these pieces, they all got to use Turkish percussion. Turkish percussion was bass drum, cymbals, and triangle, and maybe one of those jingling Johnny things, you know, one of those Turkish crescent, they're also called. It's a stick, a big metal stick with hanging with all kinds of doodads that you'd shake and it would rattle. And they all use that stuff, so it's colorful. That's how they did exotic music. They weren't into actual ethnomusicology in those days, but they still were able to characterize the parts rather well. Haydn's L'Incontro Improviso is a fun opera. It's long. It's a big, big formal, you know, Mozart's is a zingspiel. You know, basically a musical, you know, with dialogue. Haydn's is quite, quite a bit more elaborated, and it's really a marvelous piece. And then there's Gluck, who did the same story as Haydn in French, La Rencontre Imprévue, the chance encounter, and that is also a. It's it's a musical. It's a it's a you know zingspiel. Only it's in French instead of in German, and it's also just splendid, delightful. And, you know, not, not at all known. I mean, not at all known, but they're all doing the same stories, the same basic stories. And so if you like the abduction from the Seraglio, you should look into Gluck and look into Haydn because you're going to find more of the similar. It's not the same, but it's the similar. That's the point. The point isn't to be that it's identical. The point is that it's the differences that make listening so much fun. So after that, well, there's Ludwig Spohr's Faust. I'm not kidding. Good old Spohr did Faust. Does anybody care? But he did it. 
He actually did it, believe it or not. And it was very popular for about 10 minutes during the 19th century. And it's been recorded. It's on Capriccio. So if you want to get a different take on Faust, then you can stomach Spohr, which, you know, is a very, very acquired taste because his music is elegant and sweet and delightful and kind of boring. But he did Faust. <laughs> what else could I say? I've listened to it. I'm not going back. But his, his, Spohr actually wrote one really good opera. It's called, it's called Yesonda or Jesonda. And it's actually a pretty good piece. It really is. He, he allowed himself a, a smidge of theatricality. Um, Faust, well, not so much, but that's okay. It's out there, and you can go and sample it at your heart's desire. Oh, a handle. Yeah, we've got to do a handle, don't we? Because there's so many handle operas. I chose Admeto. Now, Admeto is the same thing as Alceste. Gluck's Alceste. You know Alceste? Alceste is the story of the noble, noble Greek wife who, who, you know, prays to the gods to save her husband, who's the king, Admeto, Admetus, you know, um, you know, and she offers herself in her place, and so she gets sucked down to hell, and when he wakes up, he's really kind of angry. He doesn't treat her very well, and Hercules goes and rescues her from Hades and brings her back, and they're reunited. Um, although why she'd want to get back together with her husband is incredibly, really a creep, is is sort of hard to fathom. But there's actually, Handel's version of this story is actually sort of quasi-comedic because, you know, yes, she gets sucked down to hell and all that, but then she comes back and she's like disguised as a gardener and her husband's having an affair. And, you know, it's a typical Baroque opera seria thing where everybody is disguised as everybody else and they're all in love with each other and they're all, you know, sneaking around and spying and, you know, so it's it's the Alceste story, but with many, many, many changes. And so if you know Gluck's Alceste, which tries very hard because it's a Gluckian reform opera, you know, very few recitatives, mostly, you know, very few formal arias. And so it's it's actually designed to be as stripped down and true to the actual myth as possible. You know, even though Gluck had to revise it too. And so, you know, the end, the last act of it is kind of a mess. Nobody you know, is quite sure what version to use. It has two endings. But, you know, Handel's version of it is, is very opera seria and very Baroque and traditionally so and enormous fun. You know, Handel and Gluck knew each other. Gluck was in England for a while and Handel... Handel's comment on Gluck's music was, he knows about as much about counterpoint as my cook. Actually, Handel's cook was a very serious composer also. He did more than cook. He was Handel's copyist. So he probably knew quite a bit about counterpoint, but counterpoint was not Gluck's thing at all. He was out to reform opera. So it's really wonderful to compare an opera like Handel's, which is as unreformed as Baroque opera can be, to Gluck's Alceste, which is completely, totally in a different style. But they're from within a couple of decades of each other. And, and that's what makes the comparison so fascinating. So after Handel, Massenet, Cendrillon. Oh, I love Cendrillon. It's Cinderella. You know, the big Cinderella opera is Rossini's La Cenarentola. But Massenet did one, and it's, it's a French bonbon. It's a confection. It's fluffy and light and fun. The prince in this Cendrillon, to make it even more of a fairy tale, is a trouser role. It's, it's a, a woman's role. She dresses up like a prince and pretends that she's a guy. So it's, it's really one of those like Carabino in The Marriage of Figaro. So it's, it's, it's got that French, you know, Versailles kind of quality to it. You know, it's, it's oh, it's, the music is so beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. And, it, you know, the, the, the prince was sort of, you know, so off-putting to some people later on in the recording on Sony, for example, with Frederica von Stade, or Frederica von Stade, as she's called. Um, she, the, the role of the prince is taken by a tenor because nobody could stomach having a a real soprano prince, but there's been recorded since. And, you know, we all know the story, right? Rossini takes most of the, you know, fairy godmother stuff and gets rid of it, gets the, takes the magic out. Massenet puts it back. So one is, again, very rationalistic and enlightenment sort of you know, version of the fairy tale. And the other is 
all of that romantic nonsense and irrationality replaced. And they're very, they're a lot of fun to compare. They really are. Then we've got two by Aubert. Aubert did two operas that Verdi later did. Well, Verdi and Puccini, actually. Um, so I'm just mentioning them now. One of them is Gustav III, ou La Balle Masque. In other words, Un Ballo in Mascara. Verdi's Ballo, which was really about the assassination of Gustav III of Sweden, but it had to be moved to Puritan Boston because of the censors in Italy at the time. And although Verdi wrote it in its original form, and you know, here's a little story about that because Phil Gossett, um, who was you know the the leading light behind the Verdi edition, um, had access to the original score and was able to reconstruct Verdi's original with the original characters taking place in Sweden, as Aubert's does about the assassination of Gustav III. The problem, of course, was getting permission to publish it and use it and all that for the Verdi family. Apparently, is just impossible. And, and so we know that he was working on it, but he passed away. And so, and the Verdi complete edition that he was the, you know, guiding light of, I mean, presumably it will continue, um, you know, based on his work. But what's going to happen with Unbalo and Mascara, I really don't know. But in the meantime, you've got Aubert's version, which actually was able to do the original because of the censorship in France was different from the censorship in England or something like that. So that's the real story. Then Aubert also did Manon Lescaut, believe it or not. And we know it's, there's, there's, there's Massenet's Manon and there's Puccini's Manon Lescaut, but there's also an Aubert Manon Lescaut. So if you've got the other two, you can get a third and really go for it. You know, you can do all the Manon Lescaux you want if that plot really floats your boat. You know, the story is, you know, Manon and Degria, she's a kept woman. It's kind of like La Traviata, sort of, kind of, you know, with a rich guy and she takes up with the young guy, but they get in trouble and she gets exiled to New Orleans and she dies in, in, a, in a desert, in a desert on the outskirts of New Orleans. Well, obviously, none of those people had ever been to New Orleans because you would find a hard, hard press to find the desert. I mean, you know, and if they'd known anything, they would have been exiled to the, to the swamp and they would have been, you know, eaten by alligators in the bayou. But, you know, what the heck. So there is another man on Lesko. And then, well, I, you know, a lot of these are Puccini stories. So it seems Busoni did Turandot. Yes, auf Deutsch. He did Turandot and he put green sleeves into the middle of it for some reason that nobody really knows. But Puccini did the original, the original Turandot, which was more or less a comedy. You know, Puccini wanted to make it something terribly serious. But Busoni's is also full of faux chinoiserie, if you ignore green sleeves, of course. And he made a big orchestral suite, which gets played fairly regularly. The actual opera does not get performed very much. It was designed, I think, as a sort of one actor to, or two actor, whatever it is, to, to also be performed with Arlecchino, his other Commedia dell'arte opera, because that's what these were. You know, these were Goldoni stories based on, you know, Commedia dell'arte characters, actually. You know, Ping, Pang, and Pong, you know, they were... They're comic characters. And so Busoni's, you know, like so many of these, you know, where somebody in the Romantic period or the Baroque period took the story and mangled it beyond all recognition, they go back to the original and try and do it justice. Well, did Busoni succeed? History speaks for itself, doesn't it? Which one do we listen to? Even though Puccini didn't even finish it. And we listen to his and not Busoni's. Oh, well. But it has been recorded and quite well. So you can hear Busoni's Turandot and get a sense of, you know, something a little closer to what the original story really was. Although, you know, the outlines are the same in both cases. However, last but not least, actually I am returning to one Shakespeare opera because it really is a masterpiece. And it has been recorded a couple of times and it's just phenomenal. And I don't understand why people do it. People don't do it, pardon me, but this composer has the same issue with so much of his music. I'm talking about Ernest Bloch's Macbeth. It's just fabulous. It's the same story as Macbeth. Everyone does Verdi's Macbeth. You know, Verdi's Macbeth is, is also splendid. It's wonderful. 
but Bloch's is in such a different style. It's so completely different in its musical sensibilities that it really it makes no sense that we should only have one Macbeth floating around our opera houses. We should have lots of Macbeths, as many Macbeths as we can find. It's a very operatic story. It's a wonderful story to do as an opera. And Bloch's, Bloch's, Bloch, Bloch, no, not Bloch, 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 yes. Bloch's Macbeth is a masterpiece. I remember, I remember, you know, our, our opera guy, Bob Levine, you know, who really does not suffer second-rate opera gladly. And he heard it and he was like, wow, this is a great opera. It really is. It's dramatic. It's it's blood curdling. It's full of great music. It's evocative. It's intense. It's dramatic and punchy because Block was a real hardcore, you know, emotional, hard on sleeve kind of guy. He was perfect for doing this story. And so, of all of these operas that I've listed, all of this stuff, if you're gonna hear one, listen to Block's Macbeth. Start there. You know the story. You're going to hear what he wants to do. What, you know, you're you're going to want to hear what he does with it. There. I spit it out. There you are. It's a tremendous piece of music. And I've just, it's been recorded twice. You can get the recordings, thank goodness. And it's just amazing. Absolutely amazing. A glorious piece of music. So there you go. 16 unknown operas on well-known plots. Keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.